Welcome to yet another week of Big Data and Language Technologies. Um, today was no lecture, but we will end the day with um, talking a bit more about the term projects that uh, make up most of your grade for this uh, seminar. Um, so we first go over some organizational details, um, the things that probably are most interesting to do regardless of the actual topics. Um, the first I brought is the workload that we expect of you. Um, the two modules are in Leipzig and Weimar are of a bit different uh, total time schedule. So we have 10 ECTS in Leipzig that we somehow need to fill and we have six ECTS in, um, in Weimar. And so the term project uh, will be scaled accordingly. So for Leipzig, the term project will be roughly equivalent to about six ECTS credit points. And in Weimar, we only have uh, three credit points because well, the lecture takes a, a higher part in the overall composition. The term project will be held in groups, um, and we would ask you to organize yourself into groups of two members in Weimar in Leipzig. Uh, we will allow up to three members per group, or not up to, but exactly three members per group. Um, and in case you haven't visited the Discord yet, there is a group finding channel that has seen no use yet because, well, we don't have groups. Um, but from now on, you can uh, just post there if you find any topic interesting and maybe find like-minded people um, to, to form a group with. Once you have decided on a group and also on a topic, um, please send us, so Nicholas and me for Leipzig and Yannick for Weimar, or rather all three of us to keep it simple, just send one mail to all the three of us um, with all, all your group members on CC. Um, and please only send one mail per group just so we can kind of keep track of everything. Um, by the way, these slides will be uploaded um, as always, so you don't really need to take notes. The project report at the end itself has some formal requirements. So we expect about eight pages um, of ACL double column style. Uh, so we'll provide a LaTeX template that you can just use. Um, and these eight pages include figures, but exclude references, so you can cite whatever stuff you want and as many papers as you want. Um, alongside the project report in PDF format, um, we would expect you to provide us with your code that you somehow created during, the, uh, during your work on the um, term report um, in a Git repository with full commit history, um, just so we can sort of see how the code came along. And if you have any supplementary materials, for example, you created a data set or you created a model or any evaluation resource, visualizations, all that fancy stuff, um, please also include that in some ways, in some suitable format that we can open and then review. Um, regarding the timeline of the term uh, projects, there are four steps. The first one will be to decide and uh, register for a group and a topic. Um, we will propose some topics to you that are predefined in the sense that we give general direction of where the project can go and you can sort of build your own thing inside that, uh, that sort of frame. Um, you can also propose your own topic. So if you come up with your own project idea, um, please get in touch with us until Wednesday evening this week. So we have some time to see if the idea fits some of the content of the lecture and if we can actually grade and supervise that. Um, so if you submit your own idea, we will then be in touch until the end of the week at some point um, to discuss uh, if this is a good fit or not. And if you choose a predefined topic, um, then just send us a mail until Sunday, um, the 22nd, so this Sunday evening, uh, about which topic you would prefer. Then on the uh, 20th of June, um, we have, I think this is the Sunday before the lecture on the 21st, um, we expect a project expose. I suppose not all of you have written expose yet, so it's just a one pager that describes your research plan. So, so what exactly do you want to do inside your project? Just write us a simple summarization, mm -hmm. uh, maybe include two or three relevant references so we can get an idea of the exact work you planning to do on the term report. Um, and also that just via mail to Nicholas, me, and Yannick. Then uh, two weeks later, um, if you submitted the exposé to us, we now know what you work about, but all the other people in the course don't know yet. Um, so we expect you to give a very short, roughly five minute presentation um, given by one group member here in class. Um, 
if there are any reasons against being here in person, you can of course also tune in via Zoom and have it uh, just broadcasted here. Um, and it can be one group member of your choice. So it should just be a presentation of the expose, uh, basically, the, so that all the other members of the audience get an idea of what you're actually working on. And then at the very end of the term, so the 29th of August, is it August? Yes, it's August. Um, we expect you to hand in your final report and all the supplementary material that I just mentioned. So again, this will take place via email to Nicholas Janik and me, and uh, we expect the paper in PDF format, the link to the Git repository, so you can use any Git provider you want. Um, if you have a private repository, please ask us first so you can add us using our Git name so we can have access to it. Um, and of course, all the supplementary materials in some suitable form that we can open. Okay, that's the organizational stuff out of the way. So let's talk about the actual project. Um, so the, the goal of the project is that you have some kind of, okay, okay. Um, so we can solve some kind of uh, ambitious, actual cutting edge research project. So we don't expect you to just reproduce any paper, but we want you to sort of conduct some research on your own. Um, use the nearest tools available, maybe contribute to future directions in the field. And you have relatively large freedom on how exactly you conduct your project. So we give a general outline of, of a topic, and then you can sort of build your own idea inside that. Um, the second reason we do this is that we noticed that scientific writing is something that's not really taught in the uh, CS masters as of yet. So um, we want to give you some primer on scientific writing here. So if you have never written a paper or a term project before, this would be a very good learning opportunity. Um, it's also ideal preparation for later writing a master thesis. Um, so yeah, we try to have a close feedback loop. So if you have any point need feedback from us, just get in touch and we will happily um, give, you some give you some criticism on your work. At the end of the semester, there's the optional extracurricular activity. So if you've done really well and have now an eight page uh, research project that is somehow exceeds the current state of what research is available out there, um, we of course would also be open to pursue this further as a joint publication. Um, so yeah, if you want that at the end of the semester, um, give us a heads up and then we can see if that makes sense. Um, so, that's the project now about the groups. We would greatly encourage you to form interdisciplinary groups. Um, so to combine different people of different backgrounds, different expertise, so you can all kind of benefit on each other. Of course, the, the lowest common denominator would need to be the, top, uh, the topic of the project. Um, and maybe also pay a bit of attention about the group composition in terms of, for example, technical skills or analysis skills, what you bring to the table. So um, you have a, well, a mix of everything in your group. Um, and then the next weeks, we have the single student assignments for the prompt engineering projects come up, which are supposed to be worked on like on your own, but of course you can always uh, or already get in touch with other people, give each other some feedback. So you get to know the people you will then form a group with um, for the rest of the semester for the term project. Okay, that's all the organizational stuff. Are there up to this point any questions about uh, the term projects before we dive into what actual topics are there? Okay, maybe from Weimar, no one to? All right. Then uh, I would hand over to Niklas for the. Yeah, or should I? Me. Okay. Um, okay, I will do this slide and then hand over to Nicholas. Um, so the first, I think, four topics we propose are all under kind of the umbrella of idiom extraction, um, which is a really interesting uh, research, research sort of direction where you try to create some data sets or create some tasks based on idioms that occur in large data sets. One example would be this um, IMHO paper over here. Basically, what they do is opinion mining, and to get a lot of opinions that you can then mine on, they just filter for this uh, IMHO statement. So, in my humble opinion, wait, no, this slide. Um, so, sentences that start with this, uh, it's just general net talk, I guess, um, and then whatever follows that can be viewed as an opinion. And so, using these fixed and codified figures of speech in everyday language, you can really quickly and really efficiently um, 
get insight about a lot of different things. On the one hand, to build maybe data sets for training something, um, to build data sets to analyze uh, certain uh, aspects of society. Um, one future, uh, one of the topics we will propose later will uh, talk about future mining. So people that talk about something happening in the future. And if you want to analyze that um, in sort of like a digital humanities context, it would be also a really cheap and easy way to get a lot of data for that. Um, so the next four topics really delve into this idea of define or find some idiom that you can then extract from a lot of web data and then carry out analysis, evaluation, or training data um, on top of that, and maybe talk about it more what the expected tasks and insights are. So I'll start with the first project, which is analyzing the use of idiomatic or figurative language in web data. In this case, um, this is more or less um, focused on analogies. So you have given a website or website data in general. I'll also tell you a bit how this looks uh, on our cluster here. And then you try to extract the patterns of idiomatic figurative language that Lucas already talked about, like this IMHO statements, but this is more general or broad. And such patterns could include, for example, X is defined as Y, X is the Y of field Z, and so on. And especially focusing on, on analogies. So if you want to get an impression on what these patterns look like, um, feel free after we uploaded the slides to check the second link there. Um, where I already did your job, kind of, and um, wrote a script that does exactly that, but only up until this point, and then uh, that's the part where you come in. Um, I mean, you could quickly write a regular expression that extracts exactly these um, figures in language, but um, this is not the point uh, of this project here. So on one hand, you will need to broaden this all up. We have tools for that, um, that allow you to filter for language um, that, that is used or is being used and see how much. Um, this is NetSpeak for those of you that have heard of it. Um, but here we want to find analogies in general. So generalize it a bit, but also we want uh, to have a precision-based data approach. So additional cleaning will definitely be required. And you will extract a data set. So the data is in um, a very special form stored on a cluster. Um, I think Benno in the very beginning of the lecture, um, like weeks ago, told a bit about this. Uh, we managed to acquire a large part um, of the Internet Archive, which is the, the foundation that, or the data set gathered by the same name foundation um, that you all maybe have already used if you use the Wayback Machine. So, um, yeah, basically a download of the Internet. And we have a, a few petabytes of that stored on a cluster. And right now you should already be able to have access to this um, so it's all set up through our Gamma web uh, and our entry node, and I tested it. So um, the engineering part will not be the difficult part. You have access to this web data. You have to mine through this somehow. And um, there will be some steps where you have to apply filters uh, for cleaning. So you could apply manual or pre yeah, manual precision-based um, filters that filter out um, yeah, noise, for example, but you could also apply more fancy filters that use yeah, deep learning techniques or other language technologies that we learned or will learn in this course. And then the goal is to take this one petabyte data set, for example, and extract or distill um, yeah, a data set that only contains very refined examples of this figurative language or these analogies in this case. And then you could, for example, train or fine tune a deep learning model on this data with the goal of refining, cleaning the data set again. So training on the data that you just extracted uh, to find outliers, for example, or to directly learn abstractions on this. So can we understand what people are writing about when they are using analogies? Um, I think we will also come to this again when we do the prompt engineering projects, uh, because this is quite related here. 
So as I said, the pipeline for streaming the data from the internet archive web crawls this one petabyte into the deep learning models is already available if you check check out the links. So this is really not on the engineering parts here, but rather on defining an extraction process, of course, a bit programming, sure, um, but also interpreting the results and really coming up with a way to define tasks on the data and process the data and also checking out the literature that there's already available. And as Lucas already said, these projects pretty much align or come from the same class right now. So uh, here we have the statements about the future project where you don't extract analogies, but rather statements about future predictions. In the future, we will have flying cars. In 10 years, no one, nobody will be using the internet anymore. <laughs> I don't know. Well, the point here is that we have data from roughly 10 years ago uh, until now. So, um, we can really assess not only current predictions, we are all doomed, the uh, world will no longer exist in five years, I don't know, uh, which is a bit boring because we don't know whether this is true or not, but rather also information from 10 years ago, in 10 years uh, and so on. And you could technically, you could check whether those statements actually became true. But this is not supposed to be the focus. The focus is also supposed to be on the extraction at first of this data. How can this be made robust? Um, you don't want to be sitting there and checking one petabyte of data manually. How can we increase precision and maybe what makes this hard? Then also, how can these concepts be visualized? How can you really see what's going on, what's being predicted? Clustering, for example, I think um, you all have at least uh, the people in the digital humanities studies have done things in this regard. Um, sentiment analysis would be interesting there to check whether um, people are seeing a bright future or at least have been seeing in 10 years or whether everyone had been pessimistic all along. Yeah, and also fact-checking approaches maybe if, if you find an interesting question in this um, regard. Yeah. Um, yeah, the focus here is on the performance evaluations, designing the experiments, checking a bit of bias that there might be um, to also make this open to, for example, if, if you intend to do it publication or also um, press releases like telling the media or, or appearing on TV and telling everyone what people had been thinking 10 years ago and what they are predicting right now. I don't know, maybe making this approachable, but one requirement for this is uh, checking it for bias and maybe mitigating the bias. Again, visual analytics, data exploration, of course, a large part here. Maybe should stop and ask for, or pause and ask for questions here. Because I think we have the time, not here, maybe in the chat. Uh, no, okay. Uh, explicit sentiment statements. So again, you crawl this web archive data set for patterns, which could look like I love, uh, I hate. Uh, and um, then you can again think about what can we do with this? How can we gain insights in society from this? So the question here could be, can the resulting data set be used to train sentiment classification? So if you just take those chunks, I laugh, mm -hmm, and erase the I laugh, um, yeah, can the rest be used to train a sentiment classification model, for example? How well do such statements confirm conform with existing sentiment classification data sets. So if you download a random classification data set uh, about sentiment classification uh, from the internet, um, does it align with what you are seeing here? Is this really the same definition or perception about um, sentiment in general? So a bit data set cleaning again, of course, designing the experiments and uh, working with the existing data sets and model architectures. So um, yeah, this is also something one has to like, but uh, if it sounds good to you, um, then maybe that's interesting. And to leave it a bit open here, other ideas for language patterns. So we made a quick list here, desires, I wish, I would laugh, it would be great if, 
um, calls for action is very interesting. I think we should, let's, and so on, could also be combined with so-called verbal polarity shifters, like we should avoid polluting the environment and so on. Um, also quite interesting to gain insights on this, the metal, met, the met, methodology, me, metho, yeah, thank you. This one uh, will be the same uh, probably throughout the projects are very similar or comparable, but of course the insights generated are um, individually quite interesting. Uncertainty, I don't know, nobody knows, I wish I knew. This is of course um, also, or this of course also could lead insights in, in the regards of what people should be researching, what people should be expressing better on the internet or, or add to Wikipedia, for example. Definitions, explanations, something is defined as, something is the opposite of, um, this goes in a similar direction, but takes the approach from, from the different way around. So feel free to come up with other patterns that you think, or pattern classes that you think are interesting. And uh, yeah, we are very excited to read your proposals uh, until Wednesday, as Lucas said. Um, so maybe introduce some interesting concepts to us that come from your perspective or your background and we didn't even uh, think about. That would be really interesting, I think. Okay, yeah, the next one uh, should be from Yannick. So I'll hand to you. Yeah. Um, the, the, <coughs> sorry. Um, the, the, <coughs> I'm a bit sore today, so that's why we have to do it online. Um, we, <clears throat> we want to um, classify websites here and into several categories. Um, so first of all, we want to see if this is a blog or a news post or e-commerce website. Um, and then from some of these categories, we want to actually learn um, some template patterns. And what is a template pattern? A template pattern is, um, uh, a scaffolding for extracting information in this case. So it's 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 not actually what you might think. It's um, that you um, have a front end um, and you put data into a um, template. It's actually that um, you do it the other way around. So you have this website and you see what of that website is boilerplate and what's the actual information. So for example, if you have an airline website, um, which post the flight dates and so on, then you have a template for the, for the website, which is the same for all flights and so on. And then you have the individual dates in there. Um, uh, and we want to learn this template. So we want to, for, for each website, uh, see what's the boilerplate on this website and then extract this information, for example, flight dates, authors, years, and so on. Uh, and uh, the, the focus of this is to, um, to large scale training and application of deep learning models on, on web archive data, like all the other ones, and um, we want to do information extraction, like metadata extraction, author year name, and so on. And so on. Mm, yeah, then there are also a few papers. <laughs> yes, um, for example, these, these two down here, you can look through them. And if you have any questions, then yeah, ask later. All right. Um... Wait, my mic probably should be up here. Okay, then uh, continuing um, in sort of the language generation topics here is something called constrained language generation. Um, so of course you, you know these uh, networks that can just, you give it some partial sentence and we'll just continue it for you. Um, the question in this project here would be, can we restrict whatever the model is generating for us? Um, so is there any way of enforcing the occurrence of certain tokens uh, or suffixes? Um, for example, one application of this would be to force a language model to generate poetry by just forcing it to, at the end of every predicted line, have the same uh, syllable, so it all rhymes in the end. Um, 
there are many different approaches to, to doing this. Here, three are listed, so modified beam search, scoring, or fine tuning something to specifically generate something like this. Um, also, prompt engineering would be a very an easier, but also very fruitful area here. Um, so this project is really about compiling a data set uh, and also tests to, to check if you can actually conduct constraint language generation, um, what different approaches are there to do this, what are different applications. So poetry would be one, but there are many others. Um, and uh, we linked already one paper here where exactly this uh, is, is done um, by Chris, who already gave the Hugging Face session. So he did a lot of work on um, poetry generation, essentially. And yeah, if you find any other applications of where language generation had to be constrained in some way, um, of course, this would also fit the same topic. It doesn't have to be poetry, but any kind of constraints you can integrate into a generative process for language. Um, something that's a bit different from the neural architectures that we have learned about so far is uh, this topic, which is uh, text for use detection for con uh, using contrastive learning. Um, so text we use um, is any instance of where a piece of text is reused in another document. Um, so plagiarism would be the obvious case, but there are many legitimate uh, ways of reusing text, for example, citations. Um, and the goal of this project is to, to build some kind of neural architecture that can detect and classify if two given texts contain a reused part and the next level then, which was still a bit trickier, is to exactly identify which part is we use between the two. Um, and so the general idea here is to use contrastive learning. Maybe also you have heard of this as Siamese uh, training. So you give two documents at the same time and the model sort of learns, um, I guess you can call it a similarity function between these two inputs and then predicts if this is a yes, it's reused, or no, it's not reused. And if you take it, want to take it one step further, where exactly is the reused part? Um, so there are, again, many different ways of approaching this topic. And uh, if you find one of them very interesting, there's also sort of a primer on contrastive learning down here. And also this paper at the end already did this um, text use detection, but on a very, very small scale. Um, so yeah, this would be a good topic then. This would also include some data set fusing. So there are many different existing data sets on text views, but they are all very, very small. So it would be really interesting to combine them all into one large blob of data and then see if we can actually train on top of that. Um, one word of warning, if you have no idea of what contrastive learning, so given two inputs, predict something between the two is about, then the learning curve here might be a bit steep, but if you uh, already work with this, or at least you know what this is, um, it might be very interesting to you. Okay, um, and of course, you can always propose your own topic. Uh, so if you have any idea of, uh, on, on something that falls under the general umbrella of combining language data with neural or big data technologies, we are very welcome to propose it to us. Um, just write us an email and to sort of streamline the process a bit more um, in that email, please explain what exactly is the problem that you want to address, um, what techniques, so what kind of technical background do you want to apply to this problem. Um, also, if there's data available or if you would need to curate data to answer this, um, this specific task. And then finally, what are the deliverables in this context? So what are the actual things that need to be produced? At the, what are the goals of your project, essentially? Um, so yeah, just write us an email if you have an own idea, and we will then get in touch with if it fits the seminar topic or not. Um, and then yeah, you are free to, to work on your own projects if you want to as well. Okay, um, this is just here for completeness. So all the emailing stuff I mentioned in the beginning. So until Wednesday, if you have an own topic, just your this topic description here until Wednesday, and then until Sunday about the other topics that you might be interested in. Once again, the reminder to uh, maybe use the um, Discord to find groups if you haven't uh, found a group already, and also use the next week to sort of get to know each other. Um, yeah, are there any questions about all of these topics? Yes. Discord. Um, the Discord is really just to find people that you want to work with. And then once you have found a group, you can just write us an email listing all the group members, listing your preferred topic, 
and then we will just assign you to it. Uh, we are very open to having multiple groups working on the same thing. So these are less topics than we would have people in the class divided by three. Um, but also these topics are very general. So I would expect if there are two groups deciding for the same topic that at some point they would probably diverge into different approaches or different viewpoints of the same topic. So yeah, it's no problem at all if uh, some groups decide for the same. Of course, you shouldn't all work on exactly one topic in the whole class, but yeah, we hope that there's some kind of um, yeah, multitude of topics. So, so. But yeah, multiple groups are, are fine. Also, if you have more people that are interested in working one thing, um, but exceed like this three person limit, just split it off into two groups and then that would also work out. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Um, yes. I mean, the topics are very broad, and there probably is a potential for failure, so to say. To... Um, it depends on how you define failure. So the, the grading in the end will not be solely based around if you were successful or not. We will also grade like the scientific style. So the scientific project, of course, can fail if you would know that it succeeds and you wouldn't yeah. need to research it. Um, so if you have a negative result, that's completely fine as long as you trace your steps, how you arrived there, why you have a negative result, for example. Um, and yeah, just no, explain that. This is just a fine. Yeah, and, and if yeah. the negative and result it just is just doesn't work, that's yeah. that's fine. Yeah. But but we were very careful to actually choose projects that are doable in some way and are not sub subject to immediate failure, or at least have exit points um, at very many places where you could branch off something is not working, branch off, try something else, or change or adjust the deliverable, of course, this is all possible. So we we also um, took some projects out where we didn't see that this is easily, man easily manageable, where it would be a bit harder to branch off if something doesn't work. We, we wouldn't offer those projects. So, but, but maybe this will be a whole question. Just let me very shortly summarize that for the people listening in on Zoom. So we didn't make these topics so broad uh, in context because they are not answered yet, but because to allow you to sort of explore in your own creativity here. Um, so all of these topics should work, um, but the way of how you get it to work is completely up to you. That sort of captures, I think, the general idea that Nick does. Was trying to mention here. And, and again maybe let's repeat the offer of very close supervision so yes. if there's something not working don't come with this in the last week come with this in the first week and it's no problem and we will be very happy to help i think most of you already noticed that uh yeah like on, on discord at the current times we are very um, happy to help you and assist you if something's not working and it's not a problem and uh, maybe let's keep it the same way throughout the project. Yeah. And also, if you feel like you're failing, approach us immediately, and you're probably not failing at all in the past two uh, You're just not seeing it from the right perspective, maybe. So once again, summarizing, um, if you have any point you run into issues, no matter where along the project, just reach out to us, and we are very happy to, to assist you in any way we can. OK, any more questions? Yes. We would generally discourage against that. Um, on the one hand, because we accepted so many people that supervising a lot of two people groups is much harder for us than supervising three people groups. So that's like the quantitative argument here. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you absolutely cannot find anyone who would be interested in working which that. Is very unlike, uh, which is unlikely, but if it happens, it would be okay. But we would strongly encourage you to try to find a third one. Just let's to, talk first, maybe. Yeah, so yeah, that should be the exception, not the rule to make two people groups. But if you, for some reason, strongly prefer or can't find another one, um, then get in touch with us and we will figure that out. Okay. Anything else? Slide, slide. 
Okay, if there's are there any other questions, I have one completely different slide here. Um, just uh, to mention this to you, we have one or more open uh, SRK or VRK positions at Temir, um, which are around 10 hours per week, but can differ less or more depending on what anyone would prefer. And we are searching for people for backend development for web services um, using this text stack right there. So go as language and using gRPC and Postgres and anything listed there. Um, we preferable to have experience there, but not required. Um, so if you are interested yourself or know someone who is uh, interested in working on this, just write me a mail and, and yeah, we can uh, figure something out there. So just short advertisement break at the end, um, and that would conclude the session for today. If